Well, good morning. It's good to be back with you again. It's been a while. In fact, how many of you were here in 2018? A few of you. I'm going to see if you can remember, because I'm going to repeat some of the things that we talked about in 2018. I'm going to give you a review of Genesis 1, because that's what I did back then. But before we get started, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and grandmothers. Hope you are having a good day today. During the week, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I began a series on science and scripture, and basically tried to set forth the importance of not only having some insight into the relationship between science and scripture, primarily to help you and all of us to be able to be more effective in the scientific world in which we live in. We live in a technological world, a world full of gadgets, a lot of people familiar with science. In fact, in our culture, science is the ultimate authority. That's in the culture, that is. And there's a relationship between science and scripture that I want to bring out. And what I've been stressing during the Tuesday and Thursday is the opposite of the priority of science, but rather the priority of scripture. So I want to demonstrate how you interpret some of those difficult passages that are under controversy like the book of Genesis, and particularly Genesis chapter 1. And what I tried to establish is that scientific truth is not absolute. In fact, scientists would admit that. In fact, they'll tell you that. No one claims that in the scientific realm. But sometimes you get the impression that maybe science is the ultimate truth and the ultimate way of finding truth. And I tried to stress the fact that uh, Scripture is absolute truth. In fact, God himself claims to be truth. And in fact, I would say that is absolute truth, is God himself. The Father, in John 3.33, John describes him as God is true. So God the Father is truth. Jesus himself claims in John 14, 6, I am the way, the what? Truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So he claims to be absolute truth. And if the Father is absolute truth and the Son is, what would you expect of the Spirit? Same thing. The Holy Spirit is described in 1 John 5, 7 as the Spirit of truth. So the Trinity is the absolute truth. So truth is personal. Truth is personal in the Godhead. And what God has revealed, obviously, would be absolute truth. And Jesus himself in John 17, 17 says, Thy word is truth in his prayer back to the Father God's truth is, or God's word is truth. So the scriptures are absolute truth in contrast to any other approach to any concept or idea or, or truth itself. We also see in Galatians, Galatians 2.14, that the gospel, the truth of the gospel, implying or relating truth to the gospel message. So that's absolute truth. So when you share the gospel with someone, you're sharing absolute truth with them. That's what I tried to develop uh, in our introduction to creation science on Tuesday and Thursday. And the conclusion that uh, I wanted to draw is that when it comes to any area of life, you need to have a starting point. We talked about presuppositions and starting points and the difference between a biblical worldview and a secular worldview. And the point that I made, Christians need to start with Scripture. Now, this is nothing new to you, but maybe for the sake of the online people, there might be some people out there that stumble onto your website. But anyway, the starting point would be Scripture 
And when it comes to the area of science, and I'd say every area, the starting point is Scripture. We believe in inspiration. We believe in full inerrancy. In other words, inerrant in everything that the Bible speaks to, whether it's science or whether it's history, not just theology. Now, there are some theologians that say, well, the Bible is inspired if it deals with theological issues, but not necessarily history or science. And I would say, no, we believe in a full inspiration and inerrancy when it comes to every area. And I believe the Bible speaks to every area because it deals with every area that we can deal with in our, our life. So the starting point is Scripture, and it sets the foundation for any area, but particularly since we're dealing with science, it sets the foundation for science And what I want to do is give you a perspective on how do you approach passages that touch on the area of science like Genesis 1. In fact, you'd be surprised at how many passages in Scripture not only touch on but speak directly to the natural realm, and that's the realm that science attempts to understand and and seek truth from. So... Uh, What I'm going to do is go through Genesis. I may not be able to have time to go through everything. There's an outline sheet there, and I've got an outline within the outline kind of stressing the relationship between Genesis 1 and science, and by the time we get done, you'll see that uh, if you just apply basic hermeneutical principles in applying any passage, you're going to be on the cutting edge of science, and science I said, true science does not contradict anything in the Word of God. In fact, it confirms what God has already revealed thousands of years ago. Now, our culture approaches the natural realm from a certain perspective. In fact, I gave the, kind of the history of the development of modern science on Thursday. And, and by the way, all of this is on the website. And if I go too fast... The uh, details of Genesis 1 are also on your website. You'll have to go back to 2018, I believe. But uh, our culture has drifted from its foundation. It was founded by Bible believers, but they've abandoned that biblical foundation, and they operate from what is described as methodological naturalism. What is naturalism? That's a belief system. That's the religion of the secularist. Methodological, in other words, what they're saying here is their method of approaching observations, the scientific method, their work in science, methodologically or their practice is naturalism. If you cannot explain things from a naturalistic perspective, then it's rejected outright. So it eliminates some truth, in fact, crucial truth. And what if you're a believer and you're in the sciences, unless you understand the things that we've been talking about in terms of this relationship between science and scripture, then you will tend to impose naturalistic theory, in other words, the ideas of men, you impose those on the scriptures, and you attempt to harmonize the, the, the text. And there are many commentaries and a lot of Bible teachers even that in fact do this to the biblical text and compromise it. And we want to take a different approach. From a biblical worldview, and this is what I was developing on Tuesdays and Thursdays, what you do is you begin with Scripture. That's where we're starting. We begin with Scripture. And then you avoid the unbelieving worldviews. You know there are compromises, things like evolution, ideas concerning the Genesis flood, etc. You reject those secular views. And in fact, you do your science from that biblical perspective. And there are scientists today, world-class scientists, that in fact do this in their approach to science because they're biblically based I could name several of them, and there's organizations, one of them uh, up in Dallas, I was going to say here in Houston, but it's in Dallas, ICR, all of their scientists operate from a biblical worldview. And then you interpret the physical data, 
And by the way, I use the word deliberately, interpret. In other words, you approach the physical realm and look at the data, and then you interpret the data. So there's interpretation in science as well. And you interpret it from a biblical worldview, and you have the parameters for good science given to you in Scripture. And we have a lot of parameters in Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis, the most important book ever written, according to Henry Morris, in fact, he would be representative of this whole school of thought. He started the ball rolling in about 1960 with his book, along with John Whitcomb, the uh, Genesis Flood, a whole movement back to the Bible in terms of scientific issues. So uh, I'm going to just basically go through Genesis, give you a brief outline. You can divide the book into two parts, primeval history, essentially the first 11 chapters, not quite to the end of chapter 11. And then verse 27 begins patriarchal history, basically laying the foundation for the nation of Israel. Where does Israel come from? In fact, that's the purpose of the book of Genesis, is to show where the children of Israel came from, as well as chronicling the origin of all things. So we can divide it into two parts. We're just going to look at the first part here. We're not even going to get to chapter 2, but look at the history of creation. And we can break that down, first two verses, the creation of the universe. And that begins with Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When it says the heavens and the earth, that's the Hebrew way of describing the universe. There's not a Hebrew word for universe. It's a merism. A merism gives you that that is most distant, in this case, and that that is closest to you, uh, representing the totality. That's what a merism is. So we're talking about most distance of galaxies, in fact, the edge of the universe, all the way to the planet that we live in. So he's talking about uh, basically the universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That certainly is a theological statement. No one would dispute that, right? <clears throat> theological statements start with God himself. And uh, they relate oftentimes to what God has done. And this passage tells us that God is the creator. So it's theological. And it gives something of his plan. Now, that's not revealed here until the end of the chapter where we have more of the plan of God. But Genesis 1-1 introduces us to the plan of God, you might say. And Henry Morris calls this the profoundest statement ever made. Genesis 1-1. No one disputes that it's a theological statement. How many of you would uh, agree that it is a scientific statement or at least a description few of you. <laughs> well, I would say uh, it deals with matter. In fact, it deals with all of matter. Science deals with that that is physical, that is material, that you can touch and feel. And here in the statement, we're talking about the composite of all of matter, the universe. It also deals with energy. We're going to see that uh, the first day of creation, we have uh, energy. Light is a form of energy. And we're going to see that there's an omnipotent creator that has built into the universe all kinds of energy. So science deals with energy, deals with matter, deals with processes, and we have the ultimate in processes here, creation, the formation of everything or the origination of everything. Science deals with agency, what causes, cause and effect, what causes things to produce whatever their end product is or a process. We have the ultimate agent, God himself. So this is a, in every way, a scientific at least description, if not even a statement. Science deals with what else? That's in Genesis 1.1. What is the first Hebrew word? It takes three in English to translate it. Deals with time. Processes take time. So we have the beginning of all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So this is a scientific statement. We could make the case it's a historical statement as well. 
It deals with time in the beginning, the beginning of all time. It deals with places, the entire universe. It deals with characters, the ultimate, God himself, the creator. And it deals with events, creation, the first and ultimate beginning event, creation. And back to theology, when we talk about this, God introduces himself in Genesis 1-1. <clears throat> and I think I, in 2018 when I was here, I spent a whole hour on Genesis 1-1. I'm just going to kind of survey it real quickly here. But I want you to notice a couple of things. There's the Hebrew name there with the English transliteration. And if you know a little bit of Hebrew, when it... When it a noun ends in an im, I am there, im, it pluralizes it. So we have Elohim, that's the most common name for God throughout the scriptures. But uh, in Genesis 1-1, we have God as separate and distinct from the creation. He's transcendent. He's distinct and separate Major distinction, all non-biblical views have this continuity of being, continuity of the gods and the creation. I could give you lots of illustrations. The Egyptians, for example, they worshiped frogs, insects, snakes, the Nile, everything else. There's this continuity of being, and that's true of virtually every religion and thought pattern. And it's true of the New Age today, by the way. In fact, it's the ultimate today, the New Age, the continuity there. You're a god, didn't you know that? <laughs> According to the New Age. It's only the Bible that uh, we have a distinct creator from the creation. So there's nothing, and God is already there, and God intervenes and creates. So that makes him separate and distinct from the creation. Very important concept in terms of not only Christianity, but reality and absolute truth. So we have a transcendent God, and that implies also that there are two realms of existence. There is a spiritual realm that, that is unseen that goes beyond the physical realm that we have here. And not only is God transcendent, and I'm going to go over this before, if God is already there before time, he's eternal. And not only is he eternal, but he's self-existent. Everything in the universe is dependent on something else, but God is distinct and separate and self-existent. He has no needs, no needs outside of himself, because he is self-existent. Now, you can find lots of other verses, and I think I used some other verses when I did this in 2018. And he's also Trinitarian. I've already hinted at it. If uh, Elohim is plural... That gives you a plural idea concerning God. Now, he's not uh, polytheist. That's not the Bible doesn't teach polytheism, but it's a unique concept that the Bible gives us. And Elohim is the subject of not only Genesis one throughout, and I think it occurs like thirty-five times in Genesis one, but throughout the Bible, the most common name for God is Elohim. And the interesting thing is it's plural, but he's not a singularity, he is plural. God is not a singularity, yet proper Hebrew, if you have a plural subject of a sentence, you have to have concord and you have to have a plural verb. And what do you have in Genesis? Now, it's not reflected so much in the English, but in the Hebrew very clearly, it's not a mistake, the verb create there or created is masculine singular. Already, Genesis 1-1 is introducing us to not only the God of the Bible, but already giving hints. I don't think it's a clear statement on the Trinity, but already giving us clear hints that God is not a singularity, but there's a plurality aspect to him that is fully developed as you go through the rest of Scripture, and particularly the New Testament, we have the doctrine of the Trinity. So God is Trinitarian. And in this case, the Creator, the omnipotent, sovereign Creator, is Trinitarian. <clears throat> 
And we could spend a lot of time on each of these. He is sovereign. We're going to see his sovereign hand, Genesis 1-1, sovereignly creating a universe. And then we have the details, the rest of the chapter. He's gracious. He didn't, because he's self-existent, he had no need for a universe. He has no need for us. But he graciously created a universe for us that we may have interaction and relationship with him, not because he needed us or needed fellowship. There's fellowship within the Godhead. There's three persons, so he doesn't need us. So creation is another gracious act. He's omnipotent, takes omnipotent power to build all of the power and energy that it is observed. In fact, Paul uses that in Romans 1 when you observe the natural realm, you are going to be able to see something of God himself. And he lists his eternal power. So he's omnipotent. He's good. In fact, you see throughout at different points in the creation, he describes it as good because it's out of his good hand from him who is a good God. And he's all wise. You can see that in the the knowledge and information he builds into the creation as you study it, the whole area of science. And he enters into covenant with mankind, and that's part of his grace. And we have the outworking of that beginning in Genesis 1.1. So some aspects of science that you can observe in 1 verses 1 and 2 here. The creator, creation distinction. We have an absolute beginning, I believe. No big bang. So we're going to have interspersed in all of this, and I think this is God's design. Genesis 1 was a polemic against the Egyptian culture and Egyptian gods, where the children of Israel were when I think the book of Genesis was written, and God was going to bring them out in the book of Exodus. And they were going to go into the land of Canaan. So the book of Genesis is a polemic against the gods of the Canaanites as well. And then later on in their history, it would be a polemic against other creation stories, for example, the Babylonians. So Genesis 1 refutes all of the creation stories that arose. But under inspiration, I think it's written to us today, and it's a polemic against modern science in our day as well. And in the text, we're going to see little hints of these ideas that go contrary to the secular worldview. For example, most people believe uh, in a Big Bang as the origin of all things. There's no Big Bang in Genesis 1. A good way of describing that, Sarfati, a creationist, describes the Big Bang as nothing exploded and became everything. (laughs) Kind of a ridiculous statement, right? And there's general relativity, there's relationship between time and energy and matter, etc. Time and matter are connected. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Notice things relating to the earth, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So Genesis 1, part of the refutation, the secular world says, we're just a tiny speck in this huge galaxy called the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is only one of 100 billion, at least what has been observed, 100 billion galaxies, maybe today a little bit more, but we're just this tiny speck. But Genesis is telling us is that Earth is the priority. And already he's talking about water and gravity. There has to be gravity because the mass held together, apparently. So what I'm touching on here is giving you kind of the foundation that Genesis lays for every area of science. So we already have things like the geophysics is going to be a priority, water, gravity, things like that. Here's their origin. They did not exist until there was a physical realm that God created. 
and we have the, the origin of physics and chemistry. So we have H2O in uh, verse 2, chemistry. And then day one, then God said, God speaks, let there be light, and there was light. So on day one, we have the means of creation, not long ages of slow evolutionary processes, but God speaks and instantaneously, as the text indicates, God said, let there be light, and what happens? There's light. It's instantaneous. It doesn't take long periods of time. So we have the means of creation, God speaking everything into existence. In fact, you have that little phrase, and God said, before every creative day, and sometimes twice in some of the creative days. So what we have right off the bat, God communicates. Not only does he deal with the natural realm, but he is a person that communicates. So he's personal. God communicates, and we have the origin of language. Not man grunting and pointing to objects and associating grunts with certain objects, but we have God speaking language. So we have the origin of languages in God, not man, and God chose to reveal himself through language. So we study his word, origin of language in God, right off the bat, right at the very beginning. So not just, this is why uh, Colossians tells us things visible and things invisible. Language would be one of those invisible things that Christ in that context created. So we have a, an intra-Trinitarian language already very early in the book of Genesis. So you have the foundation for not only science, but and, and science, by the way, needs language to be able to uh, organize and communicate certain things. So God lays the foundation for science here in terms of language. And we see the power of his word, a lot of applications we could draw. When you speak his word, when you share the gospel, you're not only sharing absolute truth, but you're sharing his word that has power, creative power to it. The power, it's his word that will convert, or he himself converts through his word, through the gospel. Power of the word, this is confirmed in Psalm 33, 6 through 9. Other passages, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host, for he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. That's the means of God's creation, simply speaking everything into existence. No processes, simply his word. And there was light. God said, let there be light. There was light. Now, what is light? You can study it scientifically. And the light that we can observe, now, scientists have noted that uh, there are forms of light that are not visible, that we cannot detect in our own senses. So the portion of the band here, the electromagnetic spectrum, as it's called, uh, the visible part is just that one little portion there, and it's blown up with the bottom part of the chart. But you have ultraviolet light on the left side. You have x-rays. These are all forms of light, you might say, or forms of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I believe on day one, God created the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And it included, obviously, that portion that we can observe. And he's created us to be able to detect those waves, light waves, and on the other side you have infrared light, microwaves, radar, radio, etc. So these are all part of the spectrum. This is energy at its basic form. So most basic energy of all is light. i give you the Hebrew word on the top there, or. If you want to know the speed of light, we want to be scientific, right? So we want to be precise, we can measure it. And by the way, God gave us language to be able to do these things and the ability to formulate these ideas in our minds and be able to come up with and calculate things like the speed of light, 186,000, 282.397, and I think there's still more 
digits after that, miles per second. There's different views on what God created on day one. A lot of theologians say that it's his light that is there because they're influenced by materialism. So uh, they have a hard time seeing light without a sun. So they might, they, they, they tend to look at this light as, but it can't be God's light because it's part of who he is and he's eternal and uh, never created his own light. He is light. So I think what, it, what we have, particularly throughout Genesis 1, it, are, are the material realm, the universe. So I think there's physical light and the, the entire spectrum here. And there's other sources of light besides the sun. So even scientists sometimes, or believers that try to make it God's light here, uh, overlook that there's chemical light as a result of chemical reactions in some cases. For example, fire is a chemical reaction, emits light. There's thermal light, there's nuclear light. If you see a nuclear explosion, the first thing, well, first thing visible obviously is great blast of light. Electricity, some of these lights in here, that's electrical light or converted in some way. And then you have the sun. So the sun is only one source of light. So day one, we have the means of creation, God speaking. We have the beginning of cause and effect. So God speaks, first cause, and there's an effect, first effect. So we have the beginning of the concept in science of cause and effect. You have the foundation of it on day one. In fact, you could go to 1-1, one, one, God created the heavens and the earth. He's the ultimate cause, the ultimate agent, and the universe is the effect of him speaking. We have the origin of language, which includes science and technology. And we have his work, no naturalism. He's the one that does the speaking. So there's no naturalism in Genesis 1. And we have the electromagnetic spectrum, a scientific endeavor of study. So we have the origin of optics right here. There would be no optics without light. God creates it. So what the scientist begins to observe is made possible as a result of God's creation. And another thing that I include this because this goes against the evolutionary thinking, we have immediacy of fulfillment. And you see that throughout the six creative days. No long ages anywhere, in fact, six days, basically, of creative work. And we have the origin of a time frame. Now, we think of time as related to the rotation around the sun and the sun, etc. But there's no sun yet, just light. So uh, it seems scientifically that... Uh, Time is independent of the sun. In fact, God creates the sun so we can measure time. So it gives us a way of measuring time, but time exists. So a time frame exists outside of the sun. And uh, everything here is young earth, young earth. We have the foundation for a relatively young earth. I include that as well because it goes contrary to evolutionary thinking. So day two, and how am I doing? I guess we're okay. Day two, we have verses six through eight. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Now I'm going to explain this a little bit more. I'm going to go more rapidly through some of the other, day, the other days of creation. This one is a little hard to imagine, so let me illustrate it. Key word here, an expanse, and I think the King James Version firmament introduced some concepts that theologians, I think, misunderstood what is actually in the text, so let me explain it. The Hebrew word for expanse is probably, that's probably a good, a very good translation, an expanse. The, the Hebrew word rakia, something spread out, thin, spread out. In fact, it, the, the word or related words was used in terms of metallurgy, 
where if you had a piece of copper, for example, and you would hammer it into a thin piece that it was made, made more useful for certain things. So this thinning out, in other words, beating it so that it's thin, is the a word related to rakia. So there's something about the universe or the atmosphere, the, not only atmosphere, but beyond that. Uh, in fact, the question is, is the atmosphere in, in, in view here or space? Well, I think you can figure that out even just from the English text because we have the sun and the moon in the expanse. And by the way, he defines it as the heavens. So it goes beyond the atmosphere. So I take it that he's talking about basically uh, space, outer space, you might say. It would include the atmosphere, but goes beyond it. So something spread thin out, and the text says that in the midst of the waters, and God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water. So you have this mass of water in verse 2, and it's probably spherical if there's gravity, and it Indicators seem to indicate that there's probably gravity to, to keep it confined or together. And in the midst of the waters, you have this expanse, something in there that uh, the text describes as an expanse. And let it separate the waters from the waters, plural. So you have some water, and then you have some other water, what it looks like here. And this expanse in the middle of the waters, it's going to separate them. Does that make sense? Everybody clear on that? Can you visualize that? And so the two views, some have held in the past that the separating of the waters is atmospheric waters from ocean waters. So atmospheric and oceanic, the two waters here. But because of uh, the, now the birds of the sky also fly in the expanse or the heavens, it's, it says in the text when we talk about them, when they're created. So it would include, I think, the atmosphere, but uh, I think it goes way beyond that. And I think what we have here is the edge of the universe and the oceans on earth, the two waters, or at least two waters. And there are world-class physicists that uh, Russ Humphreys, for one, a friend of mine, he uh, states often in talks, creation talks that he gives, that if we were to observe the edge of the universe, we would see a sphere of water based on what we have on day two here. And no one has observed it yet. In fact, we keep extending our ability to see the universe, and we haven't seen the edge yet. But he believes that if we ever are able or capable of it, we'll see a, a sphere of water. Now, this is totally way out of proportion, but God separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. So you have the earth, the waters on the earth, the middle little sphere there. Then you have an expanse that would be all of outer space. And then you have the waters above. Now it's written from the perspective of someone standing on the earth and you're looking that way. You're not looking through the earth, you're looking up. So above the waters, you find this ring of water at the edge of the universe. And there's lots of passages. In fact, you'll be amazed uh, at the number of passages that talk about this stretching of this thinness. In fact, Russ Humphreys describes outer space as the fabric of space. And he does it based on passages like uh, Psalm 104, 2. Covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. He uses imagery here. God stretched out the heavens. This is a reference to day two in Genesis chapter one. You also have Isaiah 44, 24, thus says the Lord, your redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb, I, so Yahweh, Lord here is speaking, 
I, Yahweh, or I, the Lord, am maker of all things. And by the way, here's another creation passage. I mentioned a few Thursday night. Stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all, all alone. So the stretching of the heavens is like a fabric or uh, the fabric of space, you might say. There's lots of passages. There's, here's a couple of more. Isaiah 48, 13. Surely my hand founded the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. Another reference to day two. When I call them, they stand together. So God is sovereign over the entire universe. Sovereign over the heavens. One more, Jeremiah 51, verse 15. It is he who made the earth, another creation passage, by his power, who established the world by his wisdom. So he used his word from wisdom and by his understanding, and this is Hebrew poetry, so we have another line here. By his understanding, he stretched out the heavens. Another reference to this stretching and day two. And there's lots of others, Isaiah 40, 22, 42, 5, Zechariah 12, 1, Job 26, 7. So lots of passages to this idea of God stretching out the heavens. So that's day two, stretching out of space. So we have the origin of astrophysics, unless you want to put it in Genesis 1, 1. So you have astrophysics, so those that study astrophysics, this is the foundation to it. Genesis 1 is the foundation to it, and particularly day 2. We have the possibility, it doesn't state it, and we don't know. Uh, did God create particles, and as he stretched out part of the fabric of space, or molecules out there, that later, later on he'll coalesce into the sun and the moon, and then he'll, he refers to the stars, uh, text doesn't tell us, we don't know. He might have created on day four everything that makes up the sun and the moon and the stars, but possibly day two, so that's why I say possibly there. We do have a separating of water mass, the two waters that I mentioned. We have the origin oceanography, so now we have an ocean on planet Earth. So day three... 9 through 13, then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place. So referring back to the waters, and let the dry land appear. So we have the first mention of at least one continent, and we've already spoken of waters, and it was so. God called the dry land earth. So God is naming things. By the way, this is part of language. God sets up categories. We think in terms of categories, nouns, verbs, etc. Uh, a variety of nouns, we, we visualize these in our head. This is part of language that we conceive, and then we try to communicate. And God is setting up these categories of language. God called the dry land earth, so he's naming things. By the way, the naming motif is very important in these early chapters as well. We don't have time to develop that. And the gathering of the waters he called seas, so he's identifying certain things here. And by the way, the first task he gives man is what? To name, name the animals. Part of the purpose of man, we'll get into that hopefully in a few minutes here. And God saw that it was good. There's the divine evaluation. And there's a second aspect to day three, that th second creative act. So it says, then God said again, two times, let the earth sprout vegetation. In the Hebrew, that's probably a general word that describes all of plant life. And then he gives two specific categories, more than likely, there's different ways of taking it. Plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit. And the key word here, after their kind. That's a scientific description. After their kind. We, 
In fact, in genetics and microbiology, these are more recent sciences, sciences that have arisen in the last 100 years. In these sciences, they are barely catching up with what God stated on, uh, in Genesis chapter 1. What he's saying is there's no evolution. You, there's not one kind evolving into a different kind. They're after their kind. In other words, there are genetic barriers that today geneticists will admit. So after their kind with seed in them, and then you have the immediacy of fulfillment again. No long periods of time, and it was so. So we have vegetation on the earth, and to go against the secular worldview, not in a primordial soup or in water, it's on earth. So we have plant life on earth, not in the oceans. Sarfati describes photosynthesis is one of the most important chemical reactions on earth. God creates photosynthesis on day three. We have vegetation before the sun, and the secularists say, well, how can you have life without the sun, and particularly vegetation? Well, this is cutting-edge science, cutting-edge science. You have fruit trees before you have animal life, and what do you need animal life for if you have fruit trees? Anyone heard of the word pollination? So you have to have uh, animals to pollinate, but... Uh, totally out of the evolutionary sequence. So day three, we have the origin of geophysics, the earth, or the landmass. Uh, tectonics, we might say. We can talk about it if we had time. Origin of botany, plant life. And if you study the microstructure of botany, you have genetics after its kind. And it's on earth, not in a primordial soup. You have built-in reproductive systems already in plant life. You have the origin of food and oxygen factories. That's what plants are. You have vegetation before sunlight. We mentioned that. You have fruit trees before animals. We also mentioned that as well. And uh, we have the fixity of kinds. In other words, there's no evolution. There's no one turning into another. And by the way, kinds are a broader category than species. Think of it like the dog kind or cat kind, and then within the dog kind you have variation. God created kinds, broad, broad categories. Or the horse kind, you have all of these different varieties of horses, so they're fixed. You can't go outside of those boundaries. So day 4, 14 through 19, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. So it's not till day 4 that we have lights in the heavens. And actually, it would be better translated as light bearers, but he's looking at it from just an ordinary observation, you might say. You see lights up there. But they're actually light, the Hebrew word is actually light bearers. And it has a purpose so that we can calculate time to separate day from night and let them be for signs and for seasons. So they have relationship to seasons as well and signs and for days and years. I won't get into the detail there. So on day four, we have light before stars. According to the evolutionist, light comes, first of all, from stars, particularly in our case, the sun but other stars. And you have the earth before the sun. This is totally out of order. The evolutionist has a different time frame. And you have the earth before stars and galaxies. That doesn't fit evolutionary time frame. So we have a polemic against man's thinking concerning areas of science, particularly historical science. You have the origin of stars. I, had, I didn't even look at that little phrase. No pre-existing stars. In fact, there's only two words in the Hebrew text after he talks about the sun and the moon, and he describes them as lights. He doesn't use the word sun or the Hebrew word no, moon. Uh, and after it, if you look at your biblical text, he says, and stars. And stars also. Uh, almost as a sidelight, he says, since you're wondering, 
in case you were wondering, uh, almost like incidentally, <laughs> incidentally, and stars, so I'm not omitting them, uh, or just because you're thinking about it, where did the stars come? Well, and stars. So let's move on. <laughs> and priority is earth, not the vastness of the universe. So we have the origin of stars, no pre-existing stars, and the evolutionary thinking is stars are formed by other stars. Heavenly bodies on day four, this is after life has already been created, it's plant life. So you have the origin of astronomy. You have the foundation for astronomy. Day five, flying and water creatures, verses 20 through 23. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms, swarms of creatures, swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly. So we have creation of water creatures and flying creatures. And I'm moving a little quicker here. There's a distinction between plant and animal life, a sharp distinction between plants and animals. Evolutionists don't know whether plants came first or animals and how one evolved into the other or whether we have two evolutionary lines. You know, there's no... I haven't read a whole lot on their understanding there. But from creation, easy to explain, God created distinct plants, distinct animals. We have aquatic and flying creatures at the same time. Again, goes against the evolutionary idea. Birds before reptiles. Uh, that's out of sequence. Dinosaurs. Attention is called to these large creatures, which probably is a reference to dinosaurs. So kids are interested in that. If you want to give them a biblical foundation for the study of dinosaurs, go to day five. And again, after their kind, we have that little phrase again. So there's a fixity of kinds, not only in the plant realm, but also in the animal realm. Origin of zoology. Day six, land animals and man, 24 through essentially the end of the chapter. And basically, I didn't get this far on the three-part Genesis study that I did in 2018. So this is kind of an addition, and I wanted to close on this part here, day six. I uh, might have made a few comments on day six, but not the end of it. But uh, let's conclude the creation days and summarize how you can't harmonize man's thinking and particularly evolution with Genesis 1. You have to let Genesis 1 inform you concerning areas of science. You start with Genesis 1 and it sets the foundation for everything else. So first life on earth, not in the oceans. Immediacy of fulfillment, not long ages. Fixed nature of kinds, no evolution. You have complex forms, fully created. And what are described are broad categories of fixed forms. You have, you have to have four, if we had more time, I would describe four flying creatures besides birds. Can you name the other two? Birds are one category. Anyone? Are there insects that fly? Insects? Somebody said mammals? Mammal, uh, there's a particular mammal that flies, bats. And there are probably some possible dinosaur, at least fossils, that uh, probably flew. So you have to have four evolutionary paths to flying because you have these varying uh, groups of creatures, you might say. That goes totally against evolution. You have mammals before reptiles. You have birds with water creatures at the same time. That's out of sequence. You have birds before reptiles. That goes out of the sequence. You have bird lungs different than reptiles, so you can't have an evolutionary tie there. Mammals with reptiles, that's out of sequence. You have a totally different sequence of events. 
and you have a completion. We haven't got to 31 yet, but this goes totally against evolution. If you're trying to, to compromise the scriptures, then this is what you have to end up doing. You, you have all of these problems, the, the sequence of creation, six days here, and evolution, and you have a bowl of spaghetti, basically. No correlation. So, creation of land animals, 24 and 25, and then the creation of man, most important here. Then God said, again, so God is speaking. God is verbalizing and creating by speaking. And notice, let us, who is the us? Who is he speaking to? Most Hebrew scholars think it, that he's speaking to angels, but uh, we're not created in the image of angels. We're created in the image of God. So another little hint. I don't, I don't think it's an explicit Trinitarian statement, but lays the groundwork for what the rest of the Bible will begin to uh, reveal. So us, probably this inter... Trinitarian communication, let us make man in our, again plural, our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, etc. So we have man created in the image of God, and if you study what the image of God is, we have spirituality. God is spirit, and he's built within us spirituality. We have immortality, not eternality. God is the eternal one, but he's given us eternal life, and that includes the unbeliever, I believe, but he has eternal life apart from God. The believer has eternal life in its fullest sense with God, so that's part of the image of God. Uh, I don't know if that's the case of animals. We do know there's horses that are going to come in the second coming, so there might be horses in the millennial kingdom, but I don't know beyond that. Text doesn't tell us. Immortality. Image of God includes intellect. In other words, our thinking, our mind. We have the ability to form thoughts and to communicate those thoughts through language that's part of the image of God. And we can make choices. There are absolutes. There are good ones. There are evil ones. So we have volition. We have creativity. And we're going to see that in the next part of the passage here. God created all things. Now, we don't create out of nothing like God did. But we can create and we can express creativity from things that he has already created as we utilize the material realm that he's given us. And even uh, we can create life, physical life. And we celebrate Mother's Day, right? <laughs> Creativity. And we communicate. We have the ability to communicate those thoughts, that intellect. And these are the major aspects of the image of God. So we are created in his image so day six, we have the fixity of kinds. We have mammals and reptiles on the same day. We have a distinction of mankind. Sharp distinction between man and other creatures. We're not related to primates. Distinction here. That goes against the evolutionary idea. So we have the origin of anthropology. Origin of man, the study of man. Now, when you think of anthropology, there's biblical anthropology, so distinguish biblical anthropology from uh, some of the sciences of the secular world that studies culture primarily. So, we have the purpose of man, 128. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So, we have purpose. We have a create, what I call a creation mandate. Some call it a dominion mandate. I, I prefer a creation mandate because it's part of the creation. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, the importance of family. The family is a priority in the plan of God and in the will of God and in his desire for 
male and female. That's the typical. But in general, God has created us to come together, male and female, and be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. First, very important aspect, family, marriage and family, and all that goes on within that uh, realm. Then a second aspect, subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, etc. He repeats it, repeats what he said in, what was it, verse 26. So two aspects of the creation mandate, fruitfulness, and part of the image of God is creativity, the ability to be able to create life. That's fruitfulness. So marriage and family is a high priority. And ruling, he has granted man some aspects of who he is. He is a sovereign God, and he's given limited sovereignty to mankind. So the ability to exercise sovereignty, and I'll develop the words here, but science and technology is involved here. So science and technology have part of the creation, or part of the creation mandate. And ending in manufacturing, and ending in how do you support a family is vocation. So part of the creation mandate involves everyone. Everyone is involved. Everyone has a part in what God has designed, and everyone has a purpose. And you select your vocation depending on how you feel God has called you. In fact, that's the biblical way of evaluating a job is uh, how can I serve the Lord in, in supplying my family's needs or dealing with the issues of providing for my family. There's two terms here that are used. The word subdue, the Hebrew word kabash. Uh, elsewhere, out of Genesis 1, it's a strong term. In fact, in most contexts, it has the idea of bringing into bondage. Now, outside of Genesis 1, we're talking about sin, involving sin as well. In other words, so this harsh word of bondage, uh, the word is used, uh, and I, I, I mention this because uh, there's a, a strength behind the word. But in the Genesis context, when everything is very good, I don't think it has the negative connotation. Okay? In, instead, I think what it has here, it, I think it means to harness. In other words, we are to harness the creation. And in order to harness it, what do you have to have? You have to have an understanding of the creation. That's science. So you have to have a little bit of understanding. And then you can apply that understanding and develop technology. So it involves technology. So harnessing is part of the mandate of God in the creation. And then the word to rule is, again, it's a very strong word. has the idea of to dominate or to have dominion. To rule like a king, but also like a slave master, to rule, but without sin, in this context, it has the, more the idea of management, in other words, or care. So the Bible is not anti-environmentalism, uh, we care for that that he created in order to make it productive, and we exercise some sovereignty over it, or some ability to uh, utilize it and some rule over it. So sovereign rule is delegated. Now the fall introduced uh, Satan, and he's the god of this world now, so he is ruler, but we have not lost a certain amount of sovereignty. Now it is more difficult to not only harness, to subdue, but also to rule the earth. So sovereign rule, so man's purpose to glorify God above all things, but we also have an institution of the family that is already set up in Genesis 1, very early. And then we have the concept of subduing, and in order to subdue, you need to understand what you're subduing, so you have science, and then you have technology, and you have manufacturing, <clears throat> and you have examples of these, cultivating of crops, for you women, it's shopping at, what is it, H-E-B? <laughs> and 
housing, education, communication, materials, travel, even space travel, computers, electronics, electricity, medical, all the areas that you can think of. It's part of the creation mandate. So biblical ministry is not just preaching and teaching and involvement, secretarial work and collecting funds and depositing them, that sort of thing, church work. From the biblical worldview, ministry is every believer should be involved in ministry in one way. First and foremost, your families, and it should be a ministry to your family, and then it goes beyond your family as well. So it involves raising families and everything involved in vocations. And your vocation may be your mission field as well. And it's a matter of worldview. Are you just there just to earn money, or are you there because you're serving God in the capacity that God has given you? The reformers were fairly clear on this. For example, Martin Luther said, vocation is nothing less than the theology of the Christian life. It provides the blueprint for how Christians are to live in the world and to influence their cultures. It is the key to strong marriages. There's the creation mandate. And effective parenting. So there's a relationship between how we interact with the world and primarily we interact with the world through vocation. Another writer, more recent, for Luther, vocation like justification is ultimately God's work. And that's the attitude that we should have as believers. God gives us our daily bread through the vocations of the farmer, the miller, and the baker. God creates new human beings through the vocations of father and mother. God protects us through lawful magistrates. So we interact with the world from a biblical worldview from the perspective of ministry. And in terms of science, Genesis 1 is foundations for all of the physical sciences, including physics, chemistry, oceanography, geology, we talked about some of these, geophysics, climatology, materials, the life sciences, botany, zoology, anthropology, medicine, very important. <clears throat> Uh, biochemistry, and the list goes on, genetics, agriculture. But it's the foundation also of things unseen, because he's the creator of those unseen things, like mathematics, language and linguistics, culture. The Bible speaks a lot about culture. In fact, Genesis speaks a lot about culture itself, the book of Genesis. History. And the queen of the sciences, anyone know what the queen of the sciences are? The study of God, theology. <clears throat> the queen of the, it's what used to be called the queen of the sciences. We've lost that, I guess. So man's purpose, not only to glorify God, not only the institution of family, but the subduing and ruling of earth. And then... Uh, we have the provision of God so that we can fulfill everything that he's called us to do. It's a blessing. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. In other words, it's God's provision that we may be able to fulfill our calling. Then we, we have the evaluation of all, the ultimate evaluation. We've had throughout the days, periodically, God said it was good. And then in Genesis 1.31, the end of chapter 1, God saw, Elohim saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Not just good, but very good. Perfection. And that's the creation that God created. Now, next Sunday, I'm going to talk about what happened to that very good creation. So if you want to study ahead, you might look into Genesis chapter 3. 
So God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, sixth, the sixth day. So we have a very good creation. We've talked about the first four things there. And we can worship God for his creation. God as creator means we are accountable to him as well. We're accountable to him. So we can praise him for his sovereignty in creating all things. We can praise him for giving us limited sovereignty to be able to operate in the world in which he's created us. Am I supposed to close in prayer or somebody else? Okay, let's pray. Father, we do praise you today for this revelation that uh, you've given, and I hope that it's given insight, particularly in the area of the sciences, that we may have a biblical worldview when it comes to science, and that we may appreciate what you have done and the limited sovereignty that you've given us in ruling your creation. So we praise you for that, and may we glorify you in all of these things. May we glorify you in our families, May we glorify you in our interaction with a fallen culture. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.